Here is uh, one of the famous pictures of uh, the early discovery from uh, <coughs> uh, 2012 of the uh, Higgs particle. And you can see the Higgs particle is this, this bump here. And the, the dots are the experimental measurements, and the red, the dotted, the dashed rather, and the solid red lines are a model. Uh, in this type of experiment, you do a very simple model, so I've got background plus signal, and the dot, the dashed is the background, very smooth, assuming it would have no particular structure at any given mass, and then superimposed on that is the is the signal, which is assumed, which is interpreted as the Higgs decaying in this case the two photons. I told you most particles don't go to. I mean, there are a few. Pi zeros go to two photons, but pi zeros don't have a mass of, uh, of 125 GeV. They have a mass much less than a GeV. So there is no uh, ambiguity between a pi zero and a Higgs. And this um, plot at the bottom here comes from this model. It is the signal part of the uh, um, data. This is what happens when you take the data and subtract the background. So you see a nice peak. So before we um, discuss a little more on that, we will do some codes, this Python codes that generate such peaks and see whether they stick out or not. Let me just make a personal um, comment. I still remember when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge University, and as a distinguished prof professor at that university, got up and gave a talk on what was called uh, high energy physics or particle physics in those days. And he told me that this was a particle, this pump. And I was absolutely amazed, because I didn't occur to me a, a, a bump was a particle. I thought a bump was a bump. And so I actually, that lecture was one of a few at that time which actually convinced me to do my PhD in this area, because I felt the other lectures, which would always, as far as I could see, solving the Poisson's uh, equation, del squared P equals uh, minus, plus or minus four pi rho, they struck me as rather obvious. I understood them. I was not, they weren't very exciting, whereas this was staggering, bumps being particles. And um, I'm not certain that's a very good reason to, um, uh, to, to, to decide one's career, but it did decide my career, because I, I stayed in that field, went to uh, you know, initial university, Caltech, and, and, and um, as a faculty member, and then uh, at Caltech I went more into computing. But I all this started by the professor telling me that this was a particle. Um, we now want to make a little bit of comments on the sort of analytics and the, and I pointed out to you that the, uh, we, this is sort of statistics. Notice these points here have error bars. And uh, it's these error bars which uh, which uh, go like the square root of the number of particles. And in this total signal, there are around 2,000 events, but actually in each of these bins, there'll be far fewer than 2,000 events. So, um, and actually these error bars probably have more than the statistical errors and have so-called systematic errors also built into them. So. Understanding errors is extremely important, and that underlies a lot of the analysis of these so-called counting experiments. So here is the, some of this detail, which I've already uh, given some of it, 17 miles long, 330 feet below the uh, uh, surface. Um, that's uh, whatever it is, around 100 meters. There's 9,300 magnets, and those are super cold, uh, very near uh, absolute zero. That's so that they keep their superconductivity. And uh, because of that, the, the, the actual electricity cost to run this accelerator is acceptable. If you had to have magnets which were, had high magnetic field, which were not superconducting, you could not afford it. 
And they all, these protons get up to very high velocity, so say 99.99% of the speed of light. And the six detectors of those six experimental apparatus we already discussed, which two of them, Atlas and CMS, are the general purpose detectors. And it's still, in spite of all the superconductivity, there's a lot of electricity that um, is needed, 120 megawatts to run um, this accelerator. It took 10 years to construct. I pointed out that this is a huge activity. And in fact, the fact it's such a huge activity is one of the reasons I left this field. I used to do experiments, and I just found that uh, computing was advancing faster than physics because it did not take 10 to 20 years to plan and build the next experiment. And, uh, you can go through many generations of Moore's, many, many turnovers of Moore's law in that time. And the total cost, as it points here, is uh, almost $5 billion. And um, just running the computers is $286 million annually. And um, we pointed out just um, electrical powers are a lot. And the total operating budget for the LHC is about a billion dollars per year. So that's the actual accelerator. You also have to pay the experimentalist to, um, to um, to, to, to run the experiment and to do the analysis. And I mentioned those numbers a little later on. Uh, it's about, uh, again, in the same general magnitude, half a billion dollars per year. Um, so this was started in 2008, and it, it shows that you know you have to be persevered. The initial uh, uh, runs did not get as much enough data to really be uh, significant, and only in 2012 was it clear that the Higgs had been discovered. And then people, somebody found out that it cost $13 billion to discover the Higgs. I don't want to go into whether that was worth it. Uh, as it points here, there are many uh, billionaires, maybe uh, some of those associated with other big data things, like uh, some of the social networking sites. I don't know that those are worth 13 billion, but um, they're quite high. So the Higgs is up there, it's big science, big cost, and, and it's worth it because it is Absolutely fundamental. It tells you about the nature of the forces governing everything, all the particles that make us up.